This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Hello everyone, I'm Liz Wright. I um, have a background in oral history working um, at the British Library at home on the Craft Lives Project and prior to that into theatre designers. So coming from a um, background in theatre, I'm really pleased to be hearing Heike Roms today, Professor Heike Roms. Um, give her talk. Uh, just a bit of background on Heike. She's a professor in performance studies and director of postgraduate studies <coughs> at Aberystwyth University um, and also director of a brilliant project, What's Welsh for Performance, uh, which focuses on the historiography of early performance art and includes oral history, audio and video <coughs> interviews. Um, I would recommend a look on the website for that project. Um, look forward to hearing you today. Um, and Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I've been a member of the Oral History Society for, for a few years, and so it's really, it was really nice to be asked by the Society to, to, to do something, um, say, say a little bit more about my work, and it does, it's connects to the project that uh, Liz mentioned. Could I, is everybody here from an oral history background, or are people here from performance as well? Performance? Architecture. Architecture, interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the, I, as Liz was saying, my background is in performance studies, so I've come to oral history uh, through a very particular project, which is looking at the history of, a, of performance art in the 1960s and 1970s within um, a British context. And uh, what I've been interested in in the project is not just research the history, but also asking myself, uh, maybe because I was fairly new to historical research at this, that point, also how we might go about researching historically. So it's a project that asks also quite a lot of methodological questions, particularly uh, questions around how might we approach a practice uh, such as performance art, which is uh, an ephemeral practice which leaves um, few traces and uh, and has a very, um, very um, scattered sort of d documentary record. And oral history was one of the obvious methodologies to explore because the, the work I was interested in exists just on that kind of cusp of, of, uh, of um, remembered, just only just remembered stuff. Um, but the, I think I'm, I'm in the middle of two fields, really. I mean, the conversational formats that I'm exploring are partly... Um, influenced by and inspired by oral history, but also by other genres of conversation, for example, artist interviews. Um, and there is, at the moment, uh, a big debate within art history around artist interviews and the format of artist interviews. Um, and uh, the, the discussion that art history is having around art, uh, artist interviews are usually around <coughs> questions such as um, intentionality, why would we want to ask the artist about their work? Um, isn't that reducing the work just to the meaning or to intentions? Um, what is the relationship between the scholar and the artist um, that is being established in these conversations? Is our conversations, our, our artist interviews, do they undermine the critical function of art historical work? Um, so those are some of the debates that are happening in art history at the moment. Um, and uh, if you're interested, I'm, I'm doing an, a paper in, in a couple of months' time at Queen Mary, which is looking particularly at the, at the art, artist interview aspects of my work, and will be addressing some of those questions around intentionality and, and the relationship between scholar and, and artist. Um, and they do hover a little bit in the background today as well, but I want to look at the work today more through the lens of oral history, because it is a project that has been um, very much concerned with oral history methodologies. And it's very much concerned with um, a, uh, the, the past, and it's a historical, historically driven project. Um, and also, um, it doesn't just interview artists. I've also interviewed other people, audiences, and, and other people who were involved in, in the work, so not just artists. And um, so what I would like to do today is introduce you to some of the methodologies um, that I've been exploring, particularly around um, um, notions of audience and how audiences might be involved in oral histories. 
Um, and so I'm going to keep it quite, quite close to examples, but maybe um, to start off with, there's two main points that I'd like to um, get across tonight, or the two points I would like to make. I was drawn to oral history really for two reasons, I think. One is that I found it a very interesting methodological historiographic tool. Um, and, uh, and I'm very interested in the kinds of evidence that oral history is able to produce, historical evidence. And I will say more about that in, in a bit. Um, and I was drawn to oral history from the outset, really, because um, I thought of it right from the start as a public form. Um, as a form that, <coughs> so I never thought of the oral history conversation as just an intimate one-to-one -one conversation. I always thought about this as being a way of making public um, uh, memory, sharing memory, disseminating memory. And I have an interest in, I've, I've got a long-standing interest in curating public discussions in the question of what constitutes public discourse or at what moment does a statement become a public statement? Is that just if we are speaking it in front of a lot of people or what, does, what, what makes a, a statement a public statement? And I think I was drawn instinctively to oral history because I instinctively kind of thought about this as a, as a form of, of pub, making public um, memory. Um, and uh, I will show you some examples of how I then try to go about, um, uh, about kind of working with that in my oral history projects and, and uh, emphasizing that in the history projects. Um, so the, so the, in terms of the historical, ev the way that oral history produces evidence, I think the one thing that really has, has interested me in oral history is that um, it's a particular kind of way of producing evidence, which in my opinion, and I will try and, and show an example of that uh, in a bit, makes, makes gaps and difference very productive. Um, now, I have in mind often you hear caution being articulated by people against using oral history as evidence. You know, people say, oh, it's not proper evidence because it's, uh, people's memory is fallible and, and of course, uh, really remembering the past is an, is an impossible thing to be doing and, uh, and um, uh, people fall into narrative traps and just remember um, particular things and, and change events in retrospect. And, and the setting influences people's memory and the interaction with the interviewer influences people me people's memories and therefore uh, oral history is evidence is not to be trusted. But it's actually precisely that I think that's really interested me about oral history, sort of turning it around and saying actually that is really interesting because I think what oral history sort of practices is, is how in historical research Evidence is always something that is negotiated and constructed. It's never something that's just sort of there as an object to be found, to be revealed by the researcher. Oh, look, I'll open the box and there is the past and, you know, and um, in, in form of a document. It's always something that is, is very much dependent on negotiation. And I always felt that oral history was making that somehow um, perceptible, that oral history really was, was practicing sort of um, research and action, as it were, and was really calling attention to the difficulty of engaging with the past, to the difficulty of, of remembering, to articulating memories, and that's what I've always been very interested in. So some of that, that difficulty, I think, uh, um, or history foregrounds really productively, and it makes very, very apparent that our interpretations of the past are in negotiation that's sort of happening between, in a conversation between the person who interviews and the interviewer, and that's a really productive kind of scene of, of, of engagement, I think. And, um, and, uh, and the other aspect uh, about our history's public nature, which I find fascinating as somebody coming from performance, is that our history is a situation a particular kind of public speech where the public is sort of deferred in the future. You know, you're sitting there in a one-to-one -one situation, but you're sort of thinking about who might be listening to this in the future. So there is this kind of future audience is sort of always hovering around as a possibility, as a potential, and I find that really fascinating. Um, uh, 
so you're creating kind of, you know, you're creating evidence or you're creating narration for, for some future use. Um, so there's a public there, but the public is both there and not there. It's sort of somewhere in the future. I, I don't know whether that makes sense, but I'll, I'll come back to these points. But these are the two aspects that really have fascinated me and interested me in oral history, and those are the two points that I, uh, my work has been uh, engaging with or try to engage with. And, um, and uh, so I wanted to say that outright before I come to the examples. So what I want to uh, do um, today is talk a little bit about my project, introduce you to the project, um, then talk, uh, if I've got time, um, a little bit about uh, other projects, other oral history projects that are happening at the moment in my field. I thought that might be interesting to see what other researchers are doing who are using oral history within a theater and performance a history field. Um, maybe say something very briefly about approaching oral history from a performance perspective, but then also talk more specifically um, around uh, the, the question of audiences. And maybe audiences is not really the right term for this. Maybe addressee or something might be a better term because they are not just audience. They're not just sort of <coughs> sitting there listening. They're, um, uh, I've been interested in involving publics, maybe publics might be the better word, different kinds of publics in different ways. And so I've tried to look at my work and try and identify four different ways in which I'm doing that, but that's quite an artificial, actually quite an artificial um, uh, separation between f four different kinds of address that the work's been, uh, been trying to, to uh, execute. So first, uh, first of all, a few words about my project, just that you have a, a sense of what the history is that I'm interested in exploring. As I said earlier on, my, my, my research is devoted to the early years of those forms of artistic practice that we have come to term with the catch-all term performance art, so things like happenings, uh, um, fluxus, destruction art, body art, action art in the 1960s and 1970s, so the avant-garde of the 1960s and 1970s. Um, and I'm interested in how this work came about, how it developed in that period, and I'm doing that by locating the work in Wales. Um, now, the, the um, project is, has the overall title, What's Welsh for Performance, Bethew Performance in Gymraeg, and uh, the subtitle, Locating the Early History of Performance Art in <coughs> Wales, 1965 to 1979. Now, the subtitle is intentional. It is, I'm not trying to establish um, Welsh, a history of Welsh performance art, so I'm not looking for a version of the art form that might be recognizably different from Irish performance art or German performance art or English <coughs> performance art. I'm really looking at the, the development of this art form within a Welsh context. And I'm looking at artists who were based in Wales, but also at artists who've passed through and made work in Wales. And I'm interested in the networks and exchanges that brought that work about. So questions such as, how come an artist working in Aberystwyth in 1968, how might they have heard of happenings going on in New York? Or you know, how they, did they establish um, connections with artists elsewhere? What happened when those artists came to, came to Wales? What, how, was the, how was the work influenced? Um, so I'm looking at uh, artists such as Yuko Ono, who you may be familiar with, or Joseph Beuys, or some, some big international names feature in my history as much as, as Welsh artists and, uh, and lesser known art local artists. Um, so the sorts of works that I'm looking at, uh, this is a picture from the very first happening to occur in Wales, this is from 1965 when a bunch of artists came to Cardiff and uh, uh, amongst one of the things that they did is they, they, they got a Vietnamese pig from the local zoo and let it run riot in the National Museum and these are the museum guards who are carrying out the, um, the Vietnamese pig. Um, this was, of course, a, a protest against the Vietnam War, and you know, there's, I don't want to belittle this word, there's a whole kind of, but it's quite funny as well. And uh, another piece is, I, I'm based in Abristwith, and uh, in 1968 there was a Fluxus festival happening <coughs> in the small seaside town of Abristwith. Uh, then I'm looking at destruction art in Cardiff, um, 
This is a piece by Keith Arnott, The Disappearance of the Artist or Self Burial, um, uh, which he made in Newport, near Newport, street interventions in the late 1960s in Cardiff, action art in, uh, in Wrexham. So these are the sorts of things that, that I'm looking at and, uh, and where they occurred and, and the geography of, of, of that as well. Um, so partly, of course, the work is driven by wanting to kind of question some of the established canons that have been established in, in, in art history, where we always, I always find myself teaching in Aberystwyth, I always end up teaching these students in, the, in West Wales about stuff in New York and stuff in Paris and stuff in London. And there was a moment when I thought, I wonder what artists were doing locally. There must have been people here doing stuff as well. So it's partly about, um, about questioning some of the established canons of work. Um, and, and my proposition is that these new forms of making art were actually far more widely established than those that art history has given them credit for. By just focusing on what was going on in the big metropolises, we are using, we're losing sight of the fact that performance and these new forms of art making influence people much more broadly and widely. Um, and so, and also, instead of dismissing events in a place like Wales as sort of secondary afterthoughts, um, you know, just provincial kind of copies of, 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 the, of the great pieces that we're doing elsewhere, I'm quite interested in, in, in um, I'm trying to argue that actually by remaking things, by, by remaking them locally, that's really when history you know, that's when larger development starts that we then can call really or that we can recognize as histories. That's where, where the critical mass is sort of happening um, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in these kinds of contexts. So that's the project. And so I've been working on this for a long time. Um, and uh, it's become a bit of my life's work, <laughs> which is a bit sad. Um, I'm, the, I'm the biggest pub bore. Any, any question you might have about performance art in Wales that you've, uh, you, you might wish to ask me, um, I'm, I'm delighted to answer those questions. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm writing this up for a book at the moment. But a few years ago, I got a large research grant from the HRC. And, um, and I, that enabled me to do quite extensive work. And just to give you a sense of the scope, I worked in, I counted about 55 archives and private collections where work is kept and from, that ranges from little notes to uh, uh, visual documentation to diaries and so on that I've looked at. Um, there's work, there's documentation in the Tate Archive, in the V&A, Henry Moore, but also, of course, in Wales itself, in New York. I've done some work there. And I've digitized more than 5,000 documents in the process. And the documents are all made available on, a, on an online database, which at the moment is off to, for some maintenance, but it's, it's, it's accessible. And that database contains currently material uh, on over 650 performance events that happened in Wales between 65 and 79. That gives you a sense of the, the, the amount of work that was going on there. That's about one event a week that was happening in Wales in that period um, of these, these sorts of art events. And of course, there's loads, of course, that are undocumented and that I haven't really got, a, got any um, documentation of. And I've also done an extensive oral history project. Um, some of it is, is, I'm talking today more about the, the so, sort of more um, uh, unusual methodologies maybe, but there's also a lot of quite straightforward life stories type interviews, one-to-one -one interviews. And I'll have some postcards here with my website address if anybody's interested. Um, there are, I made 45 interviews, to give you a scope, um, conducted 45 interviews with um, 61 interviewees. So there were some group interviews amongst them. And there's about, a, about roughly about 140 hours of material. Um, all the material has been um, not transcribed word for word. We've, done, we've made transcription summaries. And uh, there's extracts uh, on the website. Um, uh, f or and also the the I'm in the process of um, depositing some of that material in the British Library and in, in some other libraries. 
Um, mine is not, I mentioned earlier on, um, mine is not the only project within performance history and, and recent theater history that's using um, oral history. Um, it has, there's a considerable amount of projects actually that are using oral history who, who are um, trying to, which are trying to engage with this experimental avant-garde performance work, non-mainstream <laughs> performance work of the last 30 years. And it seems that the, the dialogic dimension of oral history is something that um, seems particularly yeah. suitable for, for documenting performance work, which was often happening also in, that was kind of um, moving away from traditional kind of narrative structures, um, you, trying to in, uh, investigate different forms of telling and was very much about the body and embodiment. And so oral history seems to be a methodology that a lot of researchers working in this area have found particularly productive. And of course, um, the generation that originated a lot of this work in the 1960s and 1970s is um, beginning to disappear. So there is sort of a, a greater sense of urgency now around capturing these voices um, um, on, uh, through oral history. Just to give you a sense of the sort of projects that are out there, there's a, a project called European Life Art Archive, which features, um, I think, 55 interviews with artists, performance artists from around Europe. And it's a, but it's an intergenerational project as well. Uh, they've not just got the the uh, founding generation, as it were, but also younger performance artists, and they are all documented on the website. Um, quite a few of them are documented by video as well as audio. I don't actually know where the where the original files are kept. It does seem to just exist primarily as a as a web archive. And these are all one to one. Um, really life story type interviews with artists talking about their practice. There's a, another project called Unfinished Histories that some of you may be familiar with. I know Liz has been, uh, been uh, in contact with Unfinished Histories. This is run by Susan Croft, who used to work for the VNA. Uh, also a, a real labor of love, I think. She's, her and my project are quite closely aligned, but she's looking um, much more at work coming from an alternative theater scene, much more ensemble-based work, whereas mine tends to be more solo work, artists who have worked either solo or, in, or in, in, uh, in pairs. Hers is more around alternative theater ensembles, um, but she looks at a similar period of the 1960s onwards to the 1980s, I think, 68 to 85 or so, I think her time frame is. And that again features a lot of interviews, um, some of which are also available online, and she does a lot of um, events as well. Um, at the moment, quite a lot of exhibition events and, and talk events around, around her project. So that's located in London. There's another project called Performance Saga, which is uh, originated in, in Switzerland, which is quite interesting. These are two younger women, one art historian and one artist, who really set this up as an intergenerational meeting point. They very deliberately set out as younger uh, scholars and artists who went out to speak to the pioneer generation. And they do only uh, interviews with female performance artists of, um, who were active in the 60s and 70s. Um, about their work, and that's all documented also on video, and you can buy those um, interviews as DVDs, and they they release them as a proper edition for with the proper publisher, art publisher, so you can buy them as as uh, as editions. So there's quite a few projects um, in the in the area of performance and alternative theatre performance art um, that uses oral history. Um, and all of them are driven by people who come from performance rather than uh, people who come from oral history, but who turn to oral history because, because, of the, because I think of the, the sense that there is an affinity in the form, <coughs> that there's something about oral history that is the conversational format and the sort of performative dimension of oral history seems to um, sit well alongside the kinds of work that these projects are trying to, trying to um, engage with. 
And there's a lot of self-reflexivity in these projects around, around using methodologies and how, how oral history might be looked at as a form of performance as well. But they, they tend to be, um, but what, what a lot of them are doing is using then the material that they generate in conversations and use those in, uh, in new um, contexts. So Performance Saga, for example, has done a whole series of events where they do public uh, presentations, where they use the conversation material that they've documented or they've made new performance work inspired by the oral history um, recordings or they've organized little festivals around this project where they invited the, the artists they interviewed to show new work. Unfinished Histories does a lot of public events uh, using the oral history materials that they've recorded. Um, but they, it tends to be, Unfinished Histories has recently started um, also doing interviews in public, but the, most of these projects have stuck to a fairly um, established one-to-one -one interview format but then found other ways of disseminating that material. So they've, they've done the interviews and then and then use the interviews to create new performance events or create exhibitions or create some kind of material with, with that. Um, in my project, I've been uh, coming at it as a, at a slightly, through a slightly different angle. And, that, um, and, uh, and that's what I want to show you uh, in a minute. I've been in also interested in the kind of, in, in the interview as a, as a sort of performative um, format. But I've been, from the outset, been quite interested in um, in how one how my, one might be able to address the interview situation itself, and maybe find different formats for the interview situation itself, and see what that might generate, what might come out if you break with that one-to-one -one conversation within an intimate uh, situation. Uh, usually interviewing people at their home place where they're quite familiar, um, but it's often a, a setting that is different to the setting that people remember and so on. And I thought, what happens if we might break with that established format? Um, so I've explored in my project a whole range of different um, uh, formats for interview for conversations now some of which you might think coming of those of you coming from oral history might think it's really stretching the the definition of what oral history is maybe too far and we can talk about this maybe later on are these still really oral histories in the classic classical sense um, but I've staged some oral histories in public, oral history conversations in public. So I'm going to be talking about that a little bit in a bit. I've done oral histories, quite a few oral history interviews at site, where I've taken people back to places where things occurred that I wanted them to remember, to explore what it is to be locating memory in a particular place. I've done reenactments of events. So rather than doing interviews first with people and then doing a reenactment of the event based on the interview, I've done reenactments of events. This is, for example, a reenactment of the Fluxus event that happened in Aberystwyth in 68. And I did it in front of eyewitnesses uh, to the original event who returned to my reenactment and then did interviews after that to kind of also gauge um, the, 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 how they remembered things and how they remembered them differently. I've done a lot of group conversations, which I personally find a really productive way of, they're not straightforward kind of life history interviews, of course, but they are often um, focused on a particular event or a particular site. And, uh, and I've been very interested in the way in which in these group interviews, memory is being negotiated between the, the different participants. Um, and I've also done projects that have involved audiences in these conversational formats. So I'll just want to talk uh, through them one by one, really, um, to show you different different approaches. <coughs> now, one one of the approach is um, is the cited interviews that I've done, um, which is taking people back to the places where they either saw or made performance work because I, I, I in my 
in my experience, it was often easier for people to remember where something occurred than when it occurred. And it's sort of um, the location acts as a certain kind of trigger also to memories. And that I was quite interested in that. And I want to show you just a little clip, which some of you have seen. I know um, Liz, and, uh, Liz certainly has seen it. Um, that uh, a clip of an interview with two artists. I just introduced them very briefly. Shirley Cameron and Roland Miller. They were making work together in the early 70s. And they met at a place near Cardiff, uh, Barry, which probably you all know now because of uh, Gavin and Stacey. But uh, Barry in the 1960s ho uh, hosted a summer school, which was the very first place where you could study jazz in the UK. It was uh, very influential on photography, but it was also a place where early performance art emerged. And Shirley Cameron and Roland Miller met there and got together there mm -hmm. and also made their first work there. And so this is a little video of them returning to Barry, um, remembering the work that they did there. If I can... And when we came to this white mark, there was a milk bottle on it, look. Yes. And either picked it up and poured it over my head. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. so. Yeah. And then That's I it then it walked on to the next one, which is up here. Mm. And I bend down, take the brush and make two little marks, one on each side of the white splash, and they continue the other light up your body to your hair. Up there and up there. And then you cut the bottle and boil it on my head again. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, so that's them remembering uh, their first performance together, which involved uh, milk. Um, <laughs> but I was interested in the in in taking people back to places and using the using locations to trigger memories and what happens there. And one of the things that I found, and this goes back to what I said at the beginning about the, the kind of evidence that historical evidence, I think, oral history helps to generate, is that I think um, in, you know, they're doing this little reenactment there that really trying to remember how collaboratively trying to remember how this worked and who did what and who put what and so on. But I think it also, th there was, there's always a sense there that, there is, that this is, there's a sort of effort of remembering going on there. And we can't get around the fact that they are much older now, they're remembering their younger self, the place has changed, they have changed, although they're returning to the place, there's no, no sense there that they're stepping back into the past. They are very changed people, the place is very changed. And I think actually that, that um, it's for me that it makes it really, it makes it very, very, um, very, again, very apparent that that all these processes of trying to trying to engage with 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 the past are are all processes of uh, that that involve a, uh, a, a, a significant amount of labor and oral history helps to I think helps to really foreground the fact that there's this real labor of remembering going on. Um, and uh, and so I've tried a, a number of projects which took this located um, um, in situ approach. One is where I took an artist. I challenged him, uh, Mike Pearson, who came to the uh, came to Cardiff in the late 1960s and made a lot of work there in the early 70s and saw a lot of work there. I invited him to just remember where he saw work in 1973. Just take me to all the places you remember in Cardiff where you saw performance work in 1973. And, uh, and we ended up at nine sites, and you, um, you know, some of them are now completely disappeared, like one is now an H&M, and, uh, and some of them are still there, some of them are still performance places. So there is a sense there in which this really underlined both the continuity and the discontinuity of this history, which, which are the places that have survived, which are the places that have disappeared. You got, just by being there, I think you got a much better sense of it. And also, I think you got a better sense, or I got a better sense as a researcher, I got a much better sense of the sort of ecology or the infrastructure that was, that helped, that was the 
case in, in Cardiff and where, as somebody who's researching that history of that period, really to get a sense of the geographical spread of those venues and how they were connected and how they were where they were in relation to one another and uh, and what was going on um, in relation to, to one another and how people might have been moving around, uh, around them and between them. Um, so that was one type of, of these in situ uh, interviews to take um, artists back to uh, an artist back to a series of places and the other type was to just take one location but take a lot of people back to that one location and there's one location in, in, in Cardiff which is Chapter Arts Center which started in the early 1970s is still going and it's a place where a lot of performance also other art forms were taking place in the uh, in the last 40 years and so I invited people um, to return to Chapter, and Chapter has is an old school. It was an old school building, um, and has been uh, renovated several times over. It's now very different in in, in architecture than it was when uh, when the artist moved into the building in the early 70s. So I invited people to take me around the building and try to remember what they saw where, and really walk through the building and really talk about their memories in, in different places in the building. And that I made an audio guide from it. So uh, I edited the material together and then audiences could come and take the, could take the, the uh, audio guide and walk through the building of chapter listening to the interviews. And so there were certain stops where they would then stand and listen to what the artist had been talking about that particular place. Um, and uh, I'll just show you maybe a very brief clip Let's see if I can make this work I think at the beginning it's just me talking oh, as they opened up the building, how they transformed it gradually into a, a place for artists. And so we also interviewed uh, Mike Pearson, who was a member of the first resident theatre company, so he had been a resident of the theatre. And he Sorry, that's me talking then. The performance work in the 1970s. And he took us to the building as well, talking about what he could remember of um, his own work and other things work at the time. I'm interested in how people remember things. We're also interested in how people forget things. Sorry, that's, sorry, it's a little documentary this, I wanted to show. This room itself became the main rehearsal space for all kinds of companies, and I think enormous amounts of work have been generated in this room. I think it was a laboratory, it was a chemistry lab, I think. So there, you just saw this little clip with, of the interview that I did with Mike in the studio where he talks about the work, and this is a woman, and actually an audience member, listening to the interview I did with Mike in the same space. So she's in that studio just listening to the interview. You know, it was used for rehearsal, but also for performance. I think the only good thing about this were these bars, which allowed you to kind of suspend into the beams were always good. I remember the people showing something. I can't remember. One thing, um, I... Anyway, that gives you a little flavour. So that's, um, so in terms of, uh, to go back to the overall overarching theme of the talk, which is about audiences and how might one engage audiences in oral history, that's one method which is a fairly straightforward kind of ties into a lot of the methods I was I was mentioning that other projects are using as well, where you do the interview first, and then you find some form of disseminating the interview uh, through a different kind of mode of, of publication. In this case, um, the, the audio guide. Um, and what interested me about the audio guide is that it sort of encourages audiences to uh, to, to listeners to really re-perform for themselves that kind of inquiry, to be in the place themselves, to look for traces of um, uh, uh, of the histories that were being that are being talked about as they're listening to them, rather than sitting in a booth in a library somewhere, to actually be in that place that people remember, and uh, and and re-performing that that memory was something that I was interested in. 
Um, the, the other way in which I've tried to involve audiences in the work, though, is to make them co-present in the interview situation, to actually invite them into the interview situation. And that's actually, cr uh, chronologically, was the first thing that I did. Um, uh, and as I said at the beginning, I was very interested in, in oral history as a public form. And so that was almost the first thing that I wanted to do when I thought about oral history, as I thought, why not make the oral history a public event? If I'm interviewing somebody, why not make that public? And I think the it came out of the um, it came out of the um, the 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 fact that in Wales there's very little public uh, discourse around art. There are very few fora where art is being discussed. There's very little. There are very little outlets for critical debate about art. And so I thought, if I'm talking to people about this history, why not make it public and immediately you create a kind of public awareness around the work rather than having to wait for my book to come out five years later. There's already a, a sense in which you build a community of interest around your work um, and, uh, and make that public. Um, so I, I organized quite a few of these, these public meetings um, where I interviewed artists administrators about uh, certain events um, and there were always about 100 to 150 people there um, as as live audiences um, I don't know this it's uh, let's see if I can give you just a little flavor of that yeah. where is the one thing Are you still with me, or are you? Yeah. <laughs> quite, it's quite late, quite warm in here. There was another piece being shown on that day, which um, in many ways became one of the most discussed events um, of the whole week, and that was Nigel Rolf's performance. Mm -hmm. So you building. That really was, I remember the music. Yeah. yeah. It was it was it was slowed down. It was, it was slowed down. And of course the, the, the tower eventually reaches this moment of, of instability. Um, and I don't know how many images we've got here, but it um, gets taller and taller. And the first time we did it was in the Marquis. And eventually he takes a run at it because it's kind of very athletic, very physical, um, and knocks it down. Uh, um, where does that go? Off the guy's head. Uh, but the second time, I don't know if you've got the same time, we were actually outside of the marquee. And it gathered this enormous, you know, really quite a significant audience um, who were, became quite mesmerized. Uh, and at the same time, I think we were slightly concerned about where it was going to fall. It also had some, uh, it had milk or some kind of unstable material on top of it. Yeah. And it topples over um, and collapses. And you know, you can see this was the day before you didn't have to take things for health and safety officers to check out, you know, if you get away with it or not. Um, unfortunately, uh, we always get unscathed. Well, I think probably some people got splashed with milk or whatever was on top of it. The, the, the interesting thing then was. Yeah, so you get a bit of a flavour of this. So there were there were public events, and um, there were often people in the audience who were former collaborators or who had seen the work themselves. And so there was a, also opportunities at the end for people to ask questions or for people to um, to make comments. And particularly around this whole event, I won't go into the details of it, but there was actually it was quite a contentious event in in the late 1970s. So there was still a lot of tension around around that which was very palpable in the space as we were doing the interview. Now I recognize that that's not something that you can do with everybody because it takes a certain kind of person to be able to to you know to be there on public display display and remember um, and uh, and but actually in terms of doing this with artists it's quite interesting because I think artists are often they get often asked about their work and they have a certain way as we probably all do narrativizing your your life you know you kind of have a certain way of talking about your your work and your life and so on and there's always the same story and always the same anecdotes and actually putting it into the public domain I felt was putting some pressure on the situation that maybe also 
teased out some other aspects uh, or, or maybe help break with the, the usual sort of narrativization that, that people have been, have been involved in. Um, but I was just very interested in the dynamics. What would happen if you make if you make that future audience I was talking about earlier, you know, that, that kind of potential audience that might be listening to your interviews sometime in the future, what if you bring some of those into the room itself and what happens then? Um, and also, but also using that to, to, pu to make public those memories um, instantly, really. Um, and to also maybe call attention to the fact that that, the, that memory other people have talked about, the memory doesn't necessarily belong to the person who remembers. And particularly that is the case in performance, where of course performance are always events that not just involve the artist, but also audiences as well. So they don't, the memory of these events doesn't belong to the artist in the sense. And so by opening them up, I felt that was also calling attention to the fact that these were from the outset always collective events, public events, and so the memory of them is, is also a kind of a public and a shared memory. Um, so I did quite a few of, of those. So those involved audiences in a different way, in the interview situation itself, not just uh, afterwards uh, listening. So the next type of investigation that I try to do is find ways of interviewing audiences. So actually interviewing them about their, their memories. And I found that the most challenging aspect of the work. And this is really where the nature of my, the kind of work I was looking at was really, was really um, important because I think if I know from some projects who uh, who research the history of a big theater, for example, where they can go back, they can look at box office records, there's often friends associations of the Wolverhampton Grand, and you know, and you can get you know you can get loads of people who've been to the Wolverhampton Grand once every week, and you can interview them and so on. Now, with performance art, that doesn't really exist. Um, there are no box office records, and you know, people often these are events that people just often caught out of the corner of their eye and just some obscure stuff happening over there and how do you find audiences who have really significant memories of events and you don't want to put people on the spot and because they always say oh I don't I don't know if I can help you I don't know if I can remember anything and uh, and so I've tried different but I wanted to have an audience perspective in this as well and not just interview artists or, or, or administrators organizers curators um, and so I've tried a, a few formats and one of them for example was to um, to, again, um, working with this idea of located histories, um, sorry, one step, I'm confusing myself here, um, is to, um, again, work with this, with this uh, uh, located history, and I, I organized an installation project where I had a, a large walkable map of Cardiff on the floor, again in Chapter Arts Center and invited audiences to come. I, try, I spread the word quite widely that I was going to be there for that day and I was there for 10 hours and people could come in and, uh, and add their memories to the map um, uh, of events that they saw. Um, so they came in over a period and people started drawing in their memories of events. So at the very end of the, the, the day, the whole, the whole map was covered in, in memories. But the, the main aspect of this was not so much what people had written down in the map, but the fact that this was again a kind of conduit for, for, for conversation, because I was there uh, asking people about their memories and I recorded all the, the, the conversations I had with people and they started negotiating with each other also about, you know, is this here, is this there? No, I think it was there or, you know, did you see that event? Yes, I saw that event. So, so there was, this was a, f this is, I realized stretching the notion of, of oral history quite far, but it was a conversational remembering of past events, which does fall, I think, in the wider, wider um, uh, field of, of, of oral history work. Um, and so this was very explicitly about audiences. And then the most recent one, uh, which is the one I want to uh, finish off with, is... Um, where I've tried to investigate what it would be to involve audiences as sort of co-interviewers. And that's only uh, a little 
that I've only just started with this. Um, but what is it to invite people in to share the interview process? Um, so a few months ago, in, in November, uh, to be precise, so two months ago, in November 2013, I again did this did a similar project around um, uh, Cardiff again as a as a place, uh, which was a coach trip which took people back to uh, places in Cardiff that were um, places of performance in the 1970s. And uh, there were a number of artists and, and eyewitnesses from that period were on this trip. But audiences were also able to um, ask questions of, of um, the, um, of the uh, uh, artists as well. So there was almost, I was trying to see whether we could be a kind of collective interviewee. Um, very much guided by me, of course, um, but trying to see whether whether audience could be involved in the interview process. So these are different f forms in which I've tried to um, uh, not so much, it wasn't really the intention to involve audiences, but to think about the way in which the oral history, history interview is a public, is a public uh, conversation and try and find different formats um, in which uh, the, the, um, the conversation could um, address itself differently um, to, uh, to Different kinds of pub, different kinds of communities and, and groups of publics. Um, just so, just to finish this this off, I just want to say just a one or two more uh, thoughts about um, um, what wh why oral history is so interesting to me. At the beginning, I talked about the fact that I th thought um, oral history is a very particular kind of of creating evidence which which calls attention to uh, to the fact that evidence historical evidence is always something that is constructed and made and negotiated and so on um, I want to show you just one clip and um, uh, maybe to illustrate that which is from a again from one of the public interviews that I that I did with an, an artist Shelley has seen this as well. Sorry, you've seen most of this before. Um, and with an artist called Iva Davis, who was a, who's a painter, I'll just, uh, uh, but who made happenings in the 1960s, uh, was very instrumental in the destruction of art scene in, in, in Britain at the time. And um, I invited him uh, to speak to some of the documentation of this work. And I did that quite a lot in these public conversations. I think you saw that earlier on in the clip that I showed you that quite often the documentation is used as a sort of trigger. So I show images or films of performance work and then people try and you know, try to remember. And so in this case, I, I have a, we show a little clip from a piece that he made in 1968 in Swansea, a happening. And we also have there, he has in front of him this score which he made of that piece, um, but that's not available to the audience. He looks at it as we're talking, trying to remember what the what the piece was. Um, it's a silent film, so uh, I kept all sorts of things in the pictures. Can you hear this? It's a bit um, quiet. Huh? I wonder if it worked if I said what was happening and thought, oh yes, this is the beginning. And um, yes, it's like the bird song, uh, the recording of the bird song, which I've played from. Uh, on the uh, and um, red and green spotlights on the floor, which give this feeling of the forest. And um, I really don't remember inviting him. <laughs> <laughs>
But I didn't invite him to do it. Yeah, so this, I mean, he's not quite quite uh, serious, I think, about not, um, not remembering this guy who kind of turns up and is happening naked and painted. Um, but uh, there's a lot of discussion in performance about um, the how do we research the history of performance and the inadequacy of documentation and of course you know, he talks about the colors and red and green spotlights and and the the bird song and all you see is this kind of fuzzy black and white film where you can't quite work out what's going on it's silent as well and you know and of course the the, the film doesn't capture the the past performance events so as historians we look at photographs we look at we look at f uh, film documentation and there's clearly limitations to that um, but what is interesting also is that the memory of course as we know as people who are inv uh, involved in oral history the memory can't give you the true picture necessarily either. You know, we know that memory also has has moments when it when it is uh, fallible and can't quite remember. And there were lots of instances where, in these conversations, where the memory of uh, and I'm sure you you you've all experienced this, where the memory doesn't quite gel with the with the archival document and you know they're they're not they're slightly at odds with one another but what i'm interested in is not to say you know the truth is in the memory or the truth is in the document or you know the document disproves the memory or the memory disproves the document but actually what i think is so great about oral history conversations is that those negotiations can really can kind of happen there you know you can really work out um, work out how history is being how our, our views of the past are negotiated through these sorts of gaps that open up between memories and between historical documents. And so any, as a historian, you're endlessly negotiating gaps in the evidence, I think. And so what you're endlessly doing is trying to work out some kind of version of it that, that negotiates these gaps. And I think oral history allows you to do that very productively because it calls attention, really, to, to the negotiation of these, these gaps as they're, as they're happening, as they're going on. Um, now, by... One thing that I'm quite uh, weary of as well is at the moment there is, and I'll, I'll be talking a bit, a little bit more about this in, in quorum in March in this, in this other paper I'm doing at Queen Mary, is at the moment there is a lot of, I don't know, those of you who work within universities will be aware of this, there's a lot of pressure now on us as researchers to make to do research with public impact, you know, to prove that we have public impact. And so suddenly there is a new interest in conversational formats. You know, for a long time oral history was sort of this kind of strange thing on the side that historians never took quite seriously, but now suddenly it's all about wanting to engage in the public domain and wanting to make work that is seen to be having an impact. Um, and so there's suddenly a real interest in conversational format, formats. And I do realize that by that um, the, the drive or the motivation behind my work was not necessarily um, just about participation for participation's sake. You know, let's, let's see, let's, in, let's involve communities in this work. Um, but... Um, that uh, there is there is some p potential there, though, to, to think about how, um, as researchers, how we might open up our research efforts to involve others within it. And oral history is, gives us the opportunity. It's already a collaborative act, because as a scholar, historian, you're already engaging with somebody else in conversation. But I've been quite interested in opening that out and seeing whether I could involve others in that act as well. What would happen if, if my solo scholarly effort, I mean, the classical model of a historian uh, solo uh, working by, by him or herself, shut away if we open that up and actually make the research act public. And so some of those conversations were also an effort to say the research act is not happening behind closed doors, but it's actually a, a public act. This is research is being undertaken here in this moment and and you are and we are inviting others to take part in that act and what would happen if others have a sort of different stake in that act as well. And what's been quite interesting um, in, for me and quite satisfying, a, a little 
although quite odd as well, is that through some of those public events, what has happened is that others have taken this research on and just done their own thing <laughs> with it, um, which partly has troubled me because, of course, I want to be controlling it in some way. You know, it's my research, and you know, I want to write the book about it, not you. But the um, <laughs> but at the same time, it's also been quite quite satisfying, and uh, particularly the artist that my project has brought back together after 40 years, um, often in these group conversations and so on. There's a whole other little research strand now going on where they are meeting up, they're having little reunions with each other and, uh, and researching their histories. They're posting stuff on Facebook all the time. Here, for example, where they're kind of posting images and then they're they're trying to remember together what, what went on or they're staging these sort of reunions and having kind of little conversations with each other about the history. So that's been, that's been a quite, quite nice little kind of side effect of this. Anyway, that's all I want to say. So and then uh, maybe there's some questions or some discussion about this. Thanks for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have a question? You film, do you always film? Not time? always, no, no. It was quite important, obviously. I mean, as, as far as taking someone outside into the street, mm -hmm. yeah. I feel it, it would be slightly pointless if you, if the viewer or whoever was looking at this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah you, so you have someone filming you? Yeah, I mean, th there are various versions of this. Um, for. The ones that I showed you, the extracts from that I did a chapter, I actually asked somebody to film me. Okay. Um, so a friend of mine went around with us with a camera. Those um, I did with Mike, where we went to the various um, uh, locations in Cardiff, I filmed myself. So I had a little camera there that documented that. So they're very different versions of this. But you could, I mean, the, the one, the chapter one, I could conceivably also just have that done that as an audio because people got that as an audio anyway. They didn't, I've, I've showed you the video now, but the audiences were lo listening to the audio guide. So I could have just done that as an audio guide. Um, I didn't use the visuals for the, for the audience. That was just for my own record. Um, but I could, I could do something different with them. I, I recorded the, the public conversations also on video, mainly because um, they were public already, so all that nervousness around using video and making people apprehensive, I mean, we were in the public already, so how much more apprehensive can you get? And then, um, and the, because I was showing a lot of visual material, I wanted that to be, I wanted to be able for people to see what people were responding to, rather than having an audio recording where somebody goes, oh, that photograph, and but you don't have the photograph in front of you, so I wanted, somebody who might be listening to this or seeing this afterwards be able to see the, the, the visual material that people were responding to. That's how I started. That's why I started um, video recording them. But I did also quite a lot of them just on audio. Um, uh, but they tended to be more the more straightforward one-to-one -one interviews that I did on, on audio. And there's, of course, you know, there's very different views about using video recordings in in interviews, I mean, that's some, some people would not do it at all. And but I found that uh, with when we use a lot of visual material, I just found that a better record. But. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sort of intrigued by the fact that the title in Welsh and the website in Welsh, but it seems to be a lot of English accents. Mm -hmm. Was there something Welsh? I mean, were you looking at the sort of Welshness? Yeah. I mean, as I said at the beginning, this wasn't to um, necessarily to find a Welsh version of the art form, but it's it's very much the case that in the late 1970s, Welshness um, becomes a concern in art practice. And I think you see that across in the 70s, that cultural identity suddenly becomes a big issue, whereas it might have been more around gender identities in the early in the early 70s and so on. But cultural identity becomes a big theme in the late 1970s. And then it becomes more pronounced also that artists make work really looking at Welsh issues. Even people like Ivor Davis, who I showed you the clip of just now, I mean, he he was very politicized in the 60s, but it was around issues of... Um, um, he, he was very kind of... Un, uh, he was very much involved in the anti-nuclear uh, movement and so on. And it, 
it's in the late 70s, he's a Welsh speaker as well, it became very, very much about, um, about Welsh issues. So that's one, uh, one response to this, that Welsh issues within art practice became, there's a certain kind of history to that, when those became really prevalent. The other thing is that not all the artists that I interviewed were from Wales, and that's also partly what the project was interested in. Why did people come to Wales, and you know, how did they work together? You know, and so I interviewed quite a lot of people who did come from England, and I either stayed in Wales or pa just were passing through and so on. Uh, I did a couple of, of them also in Welsh, um, uh, interviews also in Welsh, so they, they are, I've just shown you the, the English ones, um, but there are quite a lot of people who settled in Cardiff School of Art was a big drive or College of Art was a big drive of some of this work and in the 70s Cardiff and 60s Cardiff College of Art was a one of the top uh, art colleges in the UK and had a reputation for very um, very innovative work and so a lot of people came to Cardiff um, but I'm interested in that so the local scene really developed through a lot of people who were coming into Wales as well as people who were from from that place. Can you perhaps say something about how you set about finding people because mm -hmm. you've spoken about the disparate nature of their work well uh, they too must have been very disparate. Yeah, I mean, it's t taken me a long time to find some of them. Okay. And uh, um, the, when I, I mean, the, the first lot I found, I kind of knew about, but then I, once I started digging deeper, it was really through, through networks as well and, and trying to um, identify you know, people then making recommendations to others and so on. But some of them were very difficult to find. I think the most difficult lot was the, the people who were involved in the Aberystwyth event in 68, where I tried really for, actually for a number of years to find people. I found some documentation of it in the Tate, so I knew that event had happened. I'd heard rumors about it and finally found the documentation. But the guy who organized it ha had died. I then spoke to his wife, who was part of the artist's team that, that did this, had no memories of this whatsoever. She sort of knew it happened, but she didn't remember anything about it. Um, all the photographic material had been lost. All the photo photographers I co contacted, that one of them had lost his negatives in a flood, the other one had kind of thrown them away. Then I did a very cheesy article for the local paper, the Cumbrian News, where I was sort of, you know, back to the wacky 60s sort of kind of photo of me going, I'm looking for eyewitnesses, and nobody came forward. Then I wrote to the alumni group of the university, and they put me in touch with graduates from that period. And so very gradually, suddenly, somebody responded and said, yeah, I have a, kind, I have a vague memory, but I think I know somebody who might have yeah. a better memory of this and put me in touch with that person. So it took often quite a long research trail really to then get to the person, to the right person. Yeah. But it was mainly through networks. I did use a lot of, I tried to also publicize the event. I did quite a few things for BBC Wales, uh, with, you know, within Wales, interviews with BBC Wales art programs and had stuff in the papers. And But actually, fewer people came forward through that than came th really through networks. Um, um, that was more helpful really in trying to get in touch with audiences who might not be in, in involved in any kind of networks at all, who might have just randomly seen stuff. Um, but the artist I found mainly through, through existing networks. Did anyone decline to give an interview? No, no, some of them did. Um, I mean, one, a couple of people didn't want to go back to that period, not because they had any, any um, not because they had any uh, issues with me or the project as such, but they, they just didn't want to do it. They just didn't want to go back to that period. There was just something that they either had a bad time doing at the time or they just decided to move on. Um, and uh, the one of them then did in the end contact me and and we did do an interview um, but uh, yeah some some people were more reluctant but actually on the whole 
the majority of these, I mean, particularly the artists, are not especially well known. There are only a few of them really that that um, then went on to become quite well known. So they were often really pleased to be talking about their work. Yeah, kind of felt um, felt somebody was finally taking interest. Although, of course, if you look at this, there's one thing that's very noticeable. There's only one woman on there, yeah. and that is something that that did really trouble me throughout the pro. Uh, Project. I mean, this is not entirely representative of the of the people I've interviewed, but the um, but women had a very different history with this work. They often passed through this, whereas um, the quite a lot of the male artists had a much longer involvement in this work. Women had a shorter involvement often because they either for family reasons, but also it was work that was quite difficult to maintain, really. I mean, you as a performance artist, you couldn't just be in a studio and paint. You had to be moving all the time. There were a lot of festivals that they were attending and so on. So it involved a lot of moving around and women tended to find that more difficult because of the childcare commitments and so on that they had. So to be a performance artist with a really long history is, is often quite a difficult thing to maintain that kind of career. And so I found it more difficult sometimes to find the female artists who were instrumental in this because they tended to be uh, really tended to have moved on and and moved into different kinds of areas were st often still artists but working in very different kind of forms sculpture and painting and so on um, so that was often more difficult um, can I ask about the interviewees that took part in the group conversations and mm -hmm. whether any of them also did a one-to-one, -one, more mm -hmm. traditional kind of interview? Yeah, I did. Um, I did. I followed up a few of the group interviews with one-to-one -one interviews. Yeah, I did. Um, because I think the group interviews give you a very different kind of history, and it's much more about negotiating histories. And it's most, I found it particularly productive for events where there might have been a little controversy or, or events that I knew a lot of people had some kind of investment in. Um, and bringing people back around the table to remember that collectively, um, it's a bit like that that Radio Four program, you know, the sort of reunion or the or the witness <coughs> seminar stuff that Birkbeck does and so on. It's it's very productive if you. I think it's particularly productive if you're just focusing on one thing. It's really it's not really good if you're wanting to cover a long time span. But if you have one particular event, for example, you know, I found it really productive with a festival where you get everybody together and you can ask them, you know, how did you come to this particular event? What was your involvement in it? And then you get different different perspectives on it. That's sort of how the reunion program works as yeah. well. You know, it's often very, if you look, if you listen to it, it's often focused on a particular historical event and you get just different perspectives on that one event. So it gives you a very particular bit of information. So if you're looking more at the long-term developments and more at the long view, then I think one-to-one -one interviews are, are, you know, are much more manageable as well. You wouldn't be able to take a group of people through that process. It just would become very anecdotal, I think. And also with the group interviews, I found, found it, I was far more moderating. I was far more uh, involved in giving stimuli and kind of... Uh, kind of directing them so that it wouldn't just go, otherwise it goes all over the place, but actually to kind of direct people and to ask them very specific questions rather than letting them talk um, in these group group interviews. But uh, they were great fun to do and, and also generated really interesting insights, so I'm really glad I did them. That question of how to get beyond the usual narratives in an oral history interview is just so key to technique as an mm. interviewer and I think mm. it's brilliantly inventive of you to, to do it that way. Well, you, you know you said about the audience that you had sort of 200 to 200 people. I mean, I'm quite amazed really that there were so many. Were, there, were a lot of the audience, were they people that had been there? Some of them were, yeah. I mean, I, I got a little grant from the Arts Council for the public ones, mm -hmm. and so that enabled me to to uh, also have a little bit of publicity. So I, I produced leaflets and, and so on. And the Chapter Arts Center supported the project in, in, in sending the leaflets out to their, or to their, their usual, um, um, uh, uh, what's members. the word? Ma members, mailing lists, um, and so on. And uh, so there was a, a fair amount of publicity around it. And they, um, there were some events that uh, people that 
I think if you're interested in the arts in Wales, there's certain events that uh, people were aware of but knew very little about. And so there was a curiosity there that drove them there. Or it was the, the caliber of the artist that was being interviewed, so they came to hear that, that person. So it was either the, 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 the uh, status of the event or the, or the importance of the artist that, that brought people there. But yeah, but I, did, I actually put quite a lot of effort in, in, in getting people there as well. And there were lots of students there, not actually my students, but students from the art school, and that was also quite important to me. I wanted that kind of generational, I wanted the students who were working there now to be able to get a sense of the history that was happening within the place where they were studying, um, and, uh, and to connect that to that history, so there were quite a few students there as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.